Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. I'm pleased to be joined today by my friend who I haven't seen in a long time, Joe Kraft. He is the president and CEO of Alliance Resource Partners LP. They are the second largest coal miner in the eastern U.S. Joe, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Robert, it's great to see you again. Now, I didn't warn you, but uh, I have my guests introduce themselves. So imagine you just arrived somewhere, you don't know anyone, and uh, you have, say, oh, I don't know, 30 or 60 seconds to introduce yourself. Please do so. Okay. Well, I'm, as Robert said, I'm the current uh, CEO for Alliance Resource Partners, uh, which is a publicly traded uh, energy company on the NASDAQ. We've been a public company since 1999. Uh, our corporate headquarters is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we also have an operating headquarters in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I've been uh, the founder uh, of the company when it went public in 1999. We were previously part of MAPCO Inc. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I joined them in 1980. It's been a long time. Uh, our company today, we're primarily in the coal business, but we're also in the oil and gas business. Uh, in 2014, we began buying oil and gas minerals, in which we lease uh, to EMP companies. So we do have a growing segment, so we continue to invest in that on an annual basis, anywhere from 50 to $100 million a year. So uh, we've got a sizable amount of oil and gas reserves uh, that we lease. And so we're both in the coal business as well as the oil and gas business. So all hydrocarbons. Yeah, that's where we are today. Uh, but uh, everybody in the fossil fuel business uh, also has a transition arm, trying to look for opportunities uh, in the transition uh, to see what we can do to continue to provide uh, product services to our customers that we've had for 40 years. So for our utility customers, if they want to transition to something other than coal, uh, we're telling them we're not just a coal company uh, we've got a lot of resources, people, uh, access, capital, uh, and relationships that there's no reason why whatever you, fuel you ch choose or whatever uh, process you want to invest in to provide low-cost energy to your customers, that's what we're here to provide. And on the oil and gas side, the same thing. I mean, if electric vehicles are going to be uh, a growth area, then why not participate uh, with our uh, consumers uh, for our products? So, so if we've got the auto sector primarily uh, using our products for the oil business, then why not continue to partner with them to try to help them uh, provide whatever the customers are, are desiring. So uh, we're in business to, uh, to provide low cost energy and to try to make uh, America as competitive in a global economy as possible. And uh, tell me your annual revenues, what, you'll, what your run rate will be then in 2021. Joe, do you know that off the top uh, of your so head? So let's see. Let me just look that up. I just got these numbers, so I can't. Uh, so we're you know, right at $1.4 billion uh, would be our, rev our revenue this year in gotcha. uh, 2021. So now I've had uh, uh, someone I think you know, a coal analyst John Hanekamp on the on the uh, podcast. Um, talked to di you know different people around the coal business, but coal has had a big resurgence lately. Uh, I just uh, am publishing a piece that uh, last year in the U.S. coal consumption was up seventeen percent, which is a remarkable increase. So tell me what's going on. A few you know a couple of years ago, coal was out of fashion. Nobody wanted to talk about coal, and yet uh, coal use last year in the U.S. was up seventeen percent. Uh, utilities in Europe, utilities in, in in India, China are all scrambling to get coal. Coal prices are up. What's going on? Well, there's two things primarily, uh, Robert. One, you know, we're coming off of a very disruptive year, uh, 2020, with uh, the virus, with COVID. Uh, a lot of governments. We're shutting down their economy, and as a result, energy demand, you know, fell off quite precipitously in early 2020. Uh, coal was impacted just as much as other sectors, and as a result, when you're comparing 21 numbers to 2020 numbers, you have to factor in we lost about one quarter of production in 2020 that we were able to when we got back to running in mid-year 2020 we had a run rate that allowed for some of that growth. The other major factor are natural gas prices. 
Natural gas prices have grown significantly year over year in the international markets especially, right. but even in our domestic markets. So we've seen natural gas double uh, 21 in 2021 versus 2020. And for our primary customer, which is the electric utility industry, if you get $4 gas, then the economics favor coal over natural gas in uh, in providing uh, power for their customer base. Is that four dollar number? Is that the is that the real the dividing line then? Above four is is uneconomic. Well, it's for different them? for each region. It's different for each region, and it depends on transportation. So uh, there are some areas of the country if if gas is two fifty, uh, coal can compete efficiently. There's some areas where you need a little higher gas price for coal to compete. So it, there are various factors. Uh, we're an Eastern coal producer. So when I talk to you, I'm looking in uh, more on the Eastern markets, uh, what are Eastern Mississippi. Right. So our primary competitor is natural gas. Uh, renewables are not as prevalent in the Eastern United States as they are in the Western United States. So sometimes people can get tripped up with national uh, numbers so a lot of my thought process really revolves around our primary markets, which are the eastern United States. And sure. So, so a three dollar natural gas price, coal can be competitive for our cost structure and the markets that we uh, uh, target. So we will see more growth in demand with gas prices three dollars and higher. So then you're expecting a good year in 2022. Then, if that because gas is, is firmly above three now. Yes, we are. And what we found, I think coal would have been even better in 2021 had the utilities communicated earlier that they would be buying more tons, that they would have more demand for our product. They did, you know, for whatever reason, uh, they were projecting lower natural gas prices, I guess. And they did not come to the producers and say, we need you to produce more tons. And uh, until it was too late. So this past quarter, the f fourth quarter of 2021, we saw many of our customers that even though coal was more competitive, they were buying natural gas because they just could not get the supply because we as an industry had anticipated a certain production level based on what they said their needs were. And we just can't turn on a dime, especially in a country that for whatever reason is very short labor. Uh, uh -huh. So anybody and everybody in the manufacturing sector, we're having a hard time finding people. So people is the primary constraint uh, for so most how, how, of how, us. How many, how many workers are you short, Joe? Because I've heard this. I've traveled all over the country in the last few months, and I've heard this in Arkansas. I've heard it in, in Pennsylvania. How many, how many more people could you put to work if you had them right now? Well, if you look at our capacity, so we produce right at, 32.2 million tons in 2021. Uh, in 2020, we were right at 27 million tons, I think. So we sh saw that much growth. If we could hire the people, we have enough capacity that we could produce 36 million tons on an annual basis without adding uh, any new major capital uh, to expand our other operations. So. So your There's footprint, that. right? Your footprint right now. So you could go up in almost another twenty percent, something fifteen to twenty percent. Yeah. That's a big. So that's our big run deal. rate, our run rate, the last two quarters, is right at a thirty-four million ton run rate. And uh, so what I said on my last earnings call, and is still consistent, twenty-one to twenty-two, we think we'll be six to twelve percent growth, uh, and that would take if we go to the twelve percent, that would take us close to that thirty-six million ton threshold to where we. Be at full capacity. So, we how, so you're, you're, but you're back to your labor shortage. So, is that mainly people work, willing to work underground? Is it the miners? Is it the above ground well, people? Who is it? Well, it would be the coal miners, yes. And we are all underground, so it would be underground coal miners. But the key is we need to have utilities or the market signal to us that they want us to be a reliable supplier for multiple years. Right. We don't want to just go out and hire people for a quarter. Right. I got because you. Because it's hard to recruit somebody unless you're offering them some job security and job stability. Sure. Uh, if, you know, they're not wanting to want to come and work with you just for you know two or three months. So 
we're constantly asking our domestic utilities to give us some long-term contracts so we can give our lenders uh, certainty and we can give our employees certainty that uh, they've got a long-term future uh, and that uh, we've got the, the resources to give them a career like for the last 40 years we've done. Uh, right. With all the news, sometimes you have to break through the sound bite of the day to let people know that, you know, like you said a few minutes ago, you know, two years ago, you know, nobody wanted to talk about us. But the reality is uh, America needs coal uh, for the next 20 years uh, because we're the lowest cost provider of fuel uh, to the electric utility industry. We got power plants that were designed to last that long. They've already been paid for or are being paid for by their customers. The, the costs are sunk. So there's no question that you take politics out of, out of the uh, uh, decision making process that coal is the cheapest source uh, for the consumer and for uh, uh, the ability for our industrial uh, uh, manufacturers to uh, compete in a global economy. Well, let's talk about the politics here because um and, and full disclosure, so uh, uh, it, Joe helped me get into the Cardinal Mine, which is in southern Illinois. Is that correct? Uh, Western Kentucky. Western Kentucky. Forgive me. That was in 2009, so 12, 13 years ago. And that uh, that vignette, that visit to the Cardinal Mine, became the introduction to my book, Power Hungry, which came out in 2010. So um, I don't know if this is quid pro quo. If it is, it's taken a long time to make it happen. But uh, you you helped me understand the coal mining business in a different way by going underground. I'd seen under, above ground mines. Um, but this is a long intro or a sidebar. Is there a war on coal? And if so, who's 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 waging war? Who are the people that are that are that are the ones leading the charge against the coal industry? Well, the Democratic platform essentially has uh, set climate targets, climate emission targets. It's a CO2 issue. And coal has been targeted as the easy pickings, if you will, that if we could reduce the coal emissions, then it will show the rest of the world we're doing something to address climate change. And so that's started under the Obama administration. Uh, under President Trump, uh, he reversed some of those uh, judgments. As an example, he got out of the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, then you come back and Biden wins, and the very first thing he wants to do is make a statement, a political statement, to reverse Trump's decision on the Keystone Pipeline. And then there were multiple other things, like getting back into the Paris Accord you know, participating in the COP26 that was the, uh, the climate uh, meeting that they had, you know, global right. the climate meeting they had earlier uh, right. in this in, year. In, in, so, Glasgow, in Glasgow. And they had November. John Kerry traveling the world and trying to convince China, which is the major emitter of uh, fossil fuels, to join uh, in the effort because the truth is you could shut down every coal plant in America and it will not matter. If you're really focused on science, if you're focused on making a difference, you know, we are at a level and with the technology we have, we are, we do have efficient power plants that you could shut us all down and it does not matter uh, in, in making a difference in CO2, CO2 emissions around the world. China and India are the primary uh, culprits today and that's really where our focus should be, but unfortunately the Democratic Party has uh, decided that the easiest thing for them to do to sh to suggest to their political base that they're doing something is to try to shut down more coal coal fired power plants. So they're the the primary source of. Uh, but who's driving the Democrats? I mean, but who's their base? I mean, who are they trying to please? Is it environmental groups? I mean, it, it, name names here. Who's who do you think is really driving the campaign? Uh, yeah, Tom Steyer. Yeah. You know, Tom Steyer was one that, that started the, the drumbeat. You got Michael Bloomberg you know, is another one that has invested a lot of uh, money into the Sierra Club. Uh, you've got the Sierra Club and other uh, other environmental groups that, again, it's in large part, in my view, more of a money grab than it is uh, really an environmental uh, effort. But uh, I'm not saying I'm not denying that there's not climate change. Uh, but I think that there's more efficient ways 
that we could address the, the issue as opposed to having disruption and having energy crisis, having fuel shortages that we have right now. There's no reason in my mind why oil, gas, and coal has to be trading at the prices it's trading today if we had good uh, government policy on energy. But when you say to lenders or you say to customers, I don't want you to consume oil, gas, or coal, then guess what? They don't. <laughs> and then when all of a sudden there's an energy shortage, the wind doesn't blow as much, the sun doesn't shine, or all of a sudden there's a demand increase or something else happens and gasoline prices start going high, then you have the President of the United States goes to Saudi Arabia to ask for them to increase production, but they won't go to our own producers here in the United States to create U.S. jobs, to create lower cost oil. Why well, pay the transportation coming from the Middle East? I mean, those are political statements. That's not good energy policy. And truly, it's not good environmental policy. When you think about the total footprint of transporting oil from Saudi Arabia to America, as opposed to using our own uh, oil right here in our own country. So you said you used the word money grab before. So what's who's the money grab? What's the where's the money going? Well, I think that the utility sector, the power sector, the the auto sector. I mean, those are markets that have been dominated by low cost energy previously by the market, not by policy interference to try to take that market away. So when you look at the size of our of the fossil fuel markets, if you have the non-fossil people wanting to take that market away from you, they haven't been able to compete on price. So they've had to do it through public policy and to try to take markets away by mandates as opposed to by competing and or giving significant taxpayer incentives, i.e. subsidies, to the wind and the solar business uh, to uh, and or to the EVs markets and to try to encourage the auto sector to build electric vehicles instead of so there's there's a lot of money uh, that people are investing in ESG movement and when you look at the stock market and the ESG funds and look at their gains year over year because people are gravitating to quote the growth that's being mandated more by public policy than it is by consumer demand. Right. You know? So so let me ask you about that because the ESG movement is gaining momentum. Um, has any of this affected you? And you mentioned your lenders before. Have, are you are you still have access to capital? Have your have your banks uh, started talking about ESG or cutting off your credit lines? What's what's the uh, story? We there? have had banks leave our uh, revolver. So we. Your revolving, uh, your, to, your revolving credit facility that you have to, to borrow money to meet your payroll and so on is what you're talking right, about here. Yeah, for our okay. working capital needs and or for temporary acquisitions that we would then put permanent financing around. So we've had half of our banks decide, tell us that they're not going to be uh, renewing when we go to renew our revolver in 2023. Uh, they are saying don't count on us being there because of ESG purposes only. Our balance sheet is pristine. Uh, we've got you know, debt to EBITDA of less than one. So we're generating enough cash flow on an annual basis to pay what debt off we have. And yet we've got a very strong credit. Uh, but the, but, banks are, but, the bank, but the banks are telling you go somewhere else. The banks are basically saying because of ESG purposes, we've decided not to, to to reduce our exposure to the coal industry and or just to not invest in order to lend to the coal industry. And you so, now, so you said half. Movement. So you said half of your banks. So it, it, how many banks are that? How many would be, then be checking? So out? we have uh, around uh, twelve. Well, we have about fifteen banks uh, today. And so we're counting on probably having seven or eight, or and we're going to try to recruit some others to replace some of the others. So hopefully we will still have 12 or 15, uh, but we're having to go uh, market ourselves to other financial institutions that historically uh, we did not need to do that because we had banks that had been in our bank group for years, I mean, 20, 30, 40 years, that have made this decision. And based on that, pressure how, from 
Right, from ESG. So, well, you know, yeah. well, you know my brother Wally in Tulsa. You know, I love my brother. I'm very great. Uh, he's done really well for himself. A great, uh, I think he's just a remarkable businessman. He and I were talking about this. I, I, I called him last night. I said, well, you know, I'm talking to Joe Kraft. And he's, I said, what would you ask him? And he said, well, how does it feel to be in this industry where you don't, you're not getting much love here, Kraft. I mean, <laughs> let's be, uh, I would say that well, in, in many cases, you're even loathed by, you know, kind of this, the, you know, compared to the wind business. Does that, does, does you take any of this personally? How does this affect you in terms of, you know, you, you have these bankers you've dealt with for a long time and they're suddenly telling you to go somewhere else. How does that feel? Well, I mean, all I can do is educate. I mean, I, I'm a strong believer uh, that what we do is adding significantly uh, to the benefits of our country and to our people. You know, I don't know if you've had Alex Epstein on your show. I have. But yeah. Alex says it very well. And part of our challenge in the environmental arena and talking about climate is and fossil fuels, because he's written a bit a, a book on I love fossil fuels, is the you know the the folks that want to uh, you know, give the, you know, make it us uh, the villain, if you will, like you were saying, when you get all these inbound calls that you know we don't need coal anymore. You know, they're only looking at part of the equation. They're not looking at the benefits. Right. So he says he gives an example that you know when your doctor prescribes some medication and you you've got an illness, and he'll say, now here's some of the side effects of you taking this drug. But here are the benefits of taking this drug. And you typically make the decision, well, I'm going to take it because the benefits far and exceed, outweigh sure. uh, the side effects. And unfortunately, we don't have that same dialogue when it comes to coal consumption, low-cost energy, fossil fuels, whether it's autos and or uh, the power sector. So you need to, you know, there are people out there that are telling the truth, you know, like Kunin and uh, Rjorn Lomborg and... These are people that are scientists that are really trying to think in terms of what is, what should the priorities be for a global society so that you can have the benefits of lifting people from poverty around the world. When you look at how coal has been utilized in India and China, just look at the massive improvement in the quality of life for hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in our world because of fossil fuels. And sure. here in America, you know, we've had the same value and the same benefit. So our customers, as I mentioned earlier, they've got power plants they've invested in, uh, all the latest environmental uh, uh, emissions compliance uh, investments. They're willing to invest more if society would allow them to because they know that what they're doing is providing power is the lowest possible cost and the most reliable and re resilient uh, power uh, that money can buy or, or that, you know, you got nuclear and you got coal. I mean, you've got those two things that can provide low cost, reliable, resilient uh, power demand, uh, which we would love to have in all times where you can always right. just turn your switch and you know you got and you've got that power and you don't have the disruptions like you experienced last year in Texas. We did. And like Europe is experiencing uh, this year because the wind speed in Europe is about a third of what they were expecting. And all of a sudden they get caught thinking they can rely on these unreliables and then they don't have the backup. And then you've got the geopolitical in Europe with Russia building the pipeline and are they gonna hold back the gas? They not. And there's a lot of factors that go into the energy space what you're trying to do why I'm on this, this show right now is we're just educating people that you can't take energy for granted and you're going to wake up and once you shut down a power plant, you just can't bring it back. Right. It just, uh, and, and, or you get public policy that encourages people to shut down power plants that are fully funded, working fine, energy and environmentally compliant. And if, you say to the power company that we'll let you shut that down, build a new one, and we'll allow you to get a return on the old one plus the new one, but generate less power because you just shut down one plant. You got a lot more cost going to our consumers, going to our industrial base. That's not good for America. 
we should not be doing that. So I think the I'm resilience a strong energy. advocate for low cost energy. I'm a strong advocate for creating jobs. I'm a strong advocate for America having responsibility uh, for itself and not be depending on folks that may or may not really care about our future like we should be caring as responsible adults uh, for each other to make uh, America the leader of the free world. That's what, you know, my experience with my wife at the UN, most countries want America to be strong. They want us to be, uh, to have the financial resources to be able to be a world leader and to provide freedom uh, for those countries that, uh, that value freedom. Uh, they want America to be strong. And the only way we can be strong, in my view, is to be energy independent. Uh, we have to be energy dependent. We can't be dependent on other nations. Otherwise, uh, they don't share the same goals for freedom uh, that sure. Americans do. Well, let me, I'll just touch on one thing that you said that I think is really important. There's resilience and reliability issues because that's clearly the, the problem in Europe now. And you're right. Uh, I mean, I've looked at this ever since Winter Storm Uri, February 15th last year at 2 a.m., our lights went out and stayed out for two days. But yeah, which were the plants in Texas in particular that were the most resilient during the during the blackouts? It was the coal and nuclear plants, to your point. Um, so you mentioned your wife, uh, Kelly Kraft, who became a U.S. ambassador to the U.N., um, you were close to Trump, um, uh, President Trump. Uh, are you still close to him? Was, is, was are you in touch with him? I mean, he was a great advocate for the coal industry, maybe the strongest coal advocate uh, for in, any president in modern history. Um, you know, he was derided by a lot of people. He wasn't popular. You know, I, I have my issues with him. What was that like? Well, I think uh, I think America's in a better place because of Donald Trump. Uh, I think his policies. Uh, were what America needed. Had it not been for COVID, you know, we had the strongest economy we had had in decades. Uh, we had quality of life for our workers, uh, our industrial. Our coal miners loved Donald Trump. They still love Donald Trump because they know Donald Trump cared about them. He, when he said it, he meant it. His policies truly were focused on the working American. So my wife was in very involved, before she was at the UN, she was ambassador to Canada, and she was involved in the negotiation of uh, NAFTA, uh, which is now USMCA. And every day, uh, she and Robert Lighthizer would go to the president at the Oval Office to give him the posting when the negotiations were uh, reaching the level that he needed to be involved. And she would report to me that, you know, before she would leave, uh, he would say, don't forget the farmers, don't forget the coal miners, don't forget the people we're doing this for. So he was very focused on helping working Americans have the opportunity and the future that he felt NAFTA prevented uh, from the previous treaty and he wanted to improve that primarily for the American worker. and. He did so, and we're getting the benefits of that uh, right now, and that's why we're seeing even on the auto sector in the state of Kentucky, Ford just announced uh, an $11 billion investment on, with battery technology uh, manufacturing in the state of Kentucky. That would not have happened had it not been for USMCA and the auto file, some of the specific requirements of having uh, a content of our automobiles that are made in America having to have labor producing that content at a certain uh, wage per hour right. so that North American uh, workers could have the opportunity to manufacture some of those products as opposed to China, Mexico, and uh, other nations that were using sure. labor at, at rates that are not livable wages. Well, so let me ask you about that, because, you know, you made a couple points here. And, and uh, to be clear, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm disgusted. All right. So I don't, I don't think, <laughs> to me, I don't think I have a political party. But you've talked about the Democrats being anti coal and anti uh, and, and, you know, all in on renewables. And I think that's a fair assessment. And you were close to Trump and, and uh, your wife, Kelly Kraft, was ambassador to Canada and then ambassador to the U.N., 
how was it that the Republicans, in your view, and I mean, you're going to be what 72 this year, if I'm if I'm right. Um, the Democrats used to be the party of the working class, and now it's the Republicans. How did that? I'm just I'm just curious how you view the politics of how this came about, because to me, I'd still puzzle over it. That and Trump did. That was why I think he was successful, as he he understood it, he was clumsy in a lot of his politics, but he certainly understood the issue of working class Americans and advocated for them, which I hear continually in rural America when I'm there. That he understood him like no like no other president who wasn't part of that elite class. And how do you see it? Well, from my perspective, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't very involved uh, either. I mean, I grew up as a Democrat and I was pretty much apolitical most of my career. But when President Obama got elected, he had a different vision for our country. And uh, prior to that, you know, I gave to as many Democrats as I gave to Republicans because most of my life, both parties wanted the same thing. They wanted America to, to be strong. They wanted them to be uh, the leader of the free world. They wanted us all to be prosperous. They wanted us to create jobs. And I think uh, the Democrats started moving more in a progressive light to where they wanted government to, to do more uh, and the private sector to do less. And they wanted to, to encourage you know, a different lifestyle. And uh, we're seeing it today. I mean, that's one reason we got labor shortage. A lot of the Build Back Better plan was to pay not people that really are un, you know, in a situation where uh, they need some help, but they want able-bodied Americans to feel good about staying at home and giving them more and more of their life's expenditures as opposed to encouraging them to have quality of life, uh, dignity of work, uh, to get out and do your fair share so that our economy can produce the goods and produce the products so that we can have uh, the uh, strong, strong industry and strong industrial and base. Strong economy, jobs, and instead of bragging about a low unemployment rate yet when our workforce shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and we've got 10 jobs to openings to every job that people want and some people will point to well that's just the service sector but it's not i mean it the, we're talking about high paying jobs i mean we're our people if they want to work can make anywhere from 85 to 130 thousand dollars a year and these so are what, do you, people what do you start? What do you start? Under, what, 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 be three years out of high school. What is it? So what is an underground miner then? Uh, you know, when I went to the Cardinal mine, I don't know. I said it's 10 or 13, 12, 13 years ago. What is, so what is, what is a beginning miner at Cardinal or one of your underground miners? What do they make starting out? Well, if they first started out, I mean, if they're experienced, you know, they would make 75, 80,000 a year. That's a good way to experience. Then they've got to ramp it up. So they're probably 50 or something in that nature. But yeah. And that, and then they've got excellent benefits on top of what their uh, W2 earnings are. Right. So uh, you started um, uh, and you mentioned Mapco and how Mapco owned coal business. And, and you, I guess you moved to Tulsa in 1980, I guess, after you finished law school. Is that right? I got my shortly right. after that. So I was a, uh, product the energy crisis so the energy crisis occurred while i was in law school so when i got out of law school i joined a coal company in lexington kentucky in 1976 and then we sold that in 78 and i stayed with the company that bought it until mapco recruited me in 1980. gotcha and that's that explains your strong attachment to the university of kentucky right because you've been a big donor there for their uh, big wildcat i guess you're a big basketball right. fan so that so 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 am i big basketball and football right and so sports, tell me really. so tell me about the uh, the mlp structure why did uh, the master limited partnership the uh, other resource companies uh, you know, oil and gas companies have used that same structure so the pipeline companies what, why was the MLP structure so attractive? And, and is it any danger of being, uh, there's talk of, you know, about the federal level of them changing the MLP structure? What, why did you use the MLP structure and is it the, what you're going to stay with? Well, in the 19, back in 1999, and you looked at the uh, corporate rates at that time, uh, as well tax, as the tax rates, tax rates tax you're talking rates, about. Yeah, the corporate tax rates. 
so the MLPs had been used in the oil and gas sector and midstream sector. So you had uh, Kinder Morgan, uh, what at that time was the model that was very successful using an MLP structure which allowed for uh, the elimination of double taxation, basically. And they would then uh, set up a partnership that was traded publicly as opposed to a C-Corp. Right. And then they set a, a standard that was very successful. They paid distributions. People were able to get a yield vehicle that was attractive compared to other options they were looking at. And so in the middle 90s, MAPCO decided to get out of the coal business. And we ended up selling, MAPCO ended up selling that asset uh, or allowing me to go do a management buyout. And then we went to private equity to give us the funds to buy those assets. And then in 1999, they, we bought, you know, the private equity firm bought the assets from MAPCO in 1996. And then in 1999, there was a window of opportunity to allow us to uh, use the MLP model. And we were able to do that because when the company was sold in 1996, we could convert the structure from a C-Corp structure to an LLC structure to where uh, it set us up for the opportunity to do a master limited partnership and go ahead and get all the consents from all the different constituents that you had to get consents to, to convert uh, from one methodology to the other and change of ownership provisions, et cetera. Right. So when that change of ownership occurred, the private equity firm that invested in us wanted to have the option to take it, the company public in either an MLP or a C-Corp at the appropriate time. And uh, we had that opportunity in 99 and we took advantage of that and, uh, and it was has been a very successful uh, source of capital for us. Now recently you're asking about well is that model going to continue under the Trump tax cuts they were able to preserve the MLP advantage it was not as good because they reduced the corporate rates but they still allowed for the uh, LOCs to have a, another discount to where there was still an economic advantage, a tax deferred advantage to uh, invest in MLPs versus C-Corps. It wasn't as good as it was because the corporate rates got dropped so much but under the, under the Trump uh, tax cuts, uh, but it still is an advantage for an investor uh, that's looking for yield uh, uh, you know that it, it, there are tax advantages for investors to continue to utilize the MLP space. Sure. And so, so a quick station, quick station. Use it. It's still successful for us, and there's several pipeline companies and other midstream right. companies that continue to use it. Sure. Uh, just this past month, uh, we saw more uh, inflows to MLP funds than we've seen in a while. So uh, there, there are investor bases. Or investors are always trying to decide where the best place to, to put their money. And, and we're hopeful that, uh, that where energy prices are and the opportunities in front of us, uh, that we're going to see renewed interest. And we've seen it. I mean, our stock is almost tripled uh, this year. Well, let me it. ask you about that because, um, you know, uh, well, I'll be blunt here. I mean, you, you, you're a son of a lawyer, but did you ever think you'd make this much money? I mean, I mean, you, you, I mean, you've, you've been quite successful. I don't, but you, you've also been on a, something of a roller coaster ride. I was looking at eight years ago, the stock was at $45. It's been as low as three fifty. You've tripled this year. So, I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's an impolite question, but do you, do you look at that stock price and think, well, I'm worth this much today versus yesterday? Does that, or do you uh, just try to avoid? No, I don't like do that? that anymore. There was a period of time I did. But no, I'm fortunate that uh, I'm focused on other things relative to philanthropy right now more than I am building for me. But I'm, as CEO of the company, it's our responsibility and it's our it's our job to manage these assets and grow our company. So you know we're very focused on growth. A lot of that value, uh, the, the stock price was driven more off multiple than it was results because our results uh, we've had record years 
since 99, we had like 17, 18 years of record years. And, it, you know, you know, but for, uh, you know, 2019 and then the COVID, we've had the disruption to where, you know, we're now bouncing back to try to get back on the same path we were uh, in 2018 is where we're, we're targeting. And if we can do that, then we're focused on trying to grow our company, just like we did for the first 18 years, uh, even though we've had three years of choppy uh, uh, markets because of COVID primarily. Right. Uh, and the export market dropped from us in 2019. So those two things, you know, made our drop. And then you had all this ESG and all the noise of, uh, of some other factors that really just, you know, you had people running away from the energy space because of energy returns for oil and gas weren't as good. So right. there was a confluence of multiple reasons. But I think because of the energy prices that we've seen the last half of 21 and what we're projecting over the next two, three years, we've started to see renewed investor uh, interest. And you see that across the energy space, not only in our company, but you see the same with a lot of EMP companies and midstream companies. So sure. energy is a great place to invest right now. Right. So you mentioned philanthropy. What are, what are your areas that uh, you've been, you famously given to a, a lot of politicians to the university of Kentucky. What are, what are, what are the areas that you, you, uh, you, you know, like I said, well, let me ask that question again. Did you ever think you'd do this? Well, I mean, you know, coming out of law school, because I mean, you've, you've been remarkably successful and maybe that's well, an impolite I, question. No, I, I mean, I never dreamed that. Uh, and I still can't explain it. I mean, how can you explain you're in the same environment with a lot of other people and, your fortunes are different than others, and and so um, you know I feel blessed, and that's one reason I signed the giving pledge. I feel that there's a responsibility, there's a reason that I've had these resources, and it's not for me. I'm a steward, and so there's a I've got a responsibility to find ways to get back and to try to help mankind. mankind. And, and so what is that? What, and what is that giving? The giving pledge. What is that would explain that if you don't mind. So the giving pledge is an organization that was started by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, where they committed to give half their wealth to charity, uh, and then they went around to uh, people that had been successful, uh, that have sufficient amount of wealth, and said, you know, would you like to join our organization? to join forces so that we can encourage more people to make the world a better place. And so they set this organization up that provides a lot of, of resources so that if people are engaged in philanthropy, whether it be for uh, medical research or education or uh, mental health or you know anything and everything you can think of, then people that have had experience in that area can share those experiences so that if other people want to do the same thing, you don't have to start from scratch and say, well, I want to start a STEM education program for people from East Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, right. which is what I've done. Well, I, there's models out there that I could tap into and then take my money and resources to duplicate uh, successful programs in other places. So. So there's multiple people from around the world that are part of this organization, and they've committed to give at least half their their wealth to uh, to charity as opposed to you know sending it to their heirs. Bigger yachts. Yeah. Or <laughs> bigger yachts and bigger jets. Um, so let me talk about the issue of mining and metals, uh, and and well, mining in general, because I've written I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal recently about rare earth elements in China and China's dominance of that. And there's been some talk, and really, it's only been that. And I mentioned my book, uh, well, uh, Power Hungry, that you helped me in the get into the coal mine and the cardinal mine now twelve years ago. But the issue of mining is not, I mean, and mines just aren't popular. Um, so the question that I wanted to get to, there's been a lot of talk about trying to increase lithium production or rare earth element production in the U.S. How, if you started today and you had a prospective mine and you, you're in the coal business, but any kind of mine, how long would it take you to get it licensed and up and running? Well, again, it depends on exactly what product uh, you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, I'd say anywhere from 
two, usually at least two years. I mean, you've got to do enough environmental reconnaissance uh, to show what the impact of your operation would be. Uh -huh. So you have to have a database of what it is today so that when you file the permit that you can have an environmental impact statement, basically. And so you're pretty much at a minimum of a two-year process uh, before you can open any type of, uh, of mine. In and, then if you're in, and if you're in California? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we're in the eastern United States. I don't have much experience in California. <laughs> Don't think um, I'm looking there. But. Right. Um, well, I know you've got a hard stop here in a few minutes. So let me, uh, you're 70, you'll be 72 this year. And this has been your career for now, 40 some odd years. Uh, do you think about doing something else or is that you're in this for the long haul? What's, what's next for you? Uh, so we're definitely looking at uh, succession. Uh, so we're thinking in terms of what other things we should be investing in. Uh, so we've got a great platform and a great runway for the next 10 to 15 years but it'll be here sooner than later. So I'm focused on putting together a team that can invest in alternative investments that are non-fossil, uh, that uh, will provide a platform that as our plants uh, start retiring in 2030, 2035, 2040, that we've got opportunities to take the cash that we've got today and invest that in other areas. So uh, hopefully we will, uh, uh, have uh, a good team to be able to allow me to spend less time uh, here at the office. And my focus is really focused on philanthropy, and that's where I'll be spending more time. But it'll be gradual as long as I'm healthy, knock on wood, things are good right now. Uh, don't feel 72. I don't, 72 is the new 52. I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what the real saying is, but uh, uh, gotcha. yeah, I think that it's. There's, you know, we're looking to provide opportunities, and we're definitely looking to uh, to build teams that can take this company and build on its success, so that that uh, we can provide opportunity to the people that have helped build this company and, and uh, uh, help us do all the great things we do for the communities we're in. So uh, my guest, by the way, is Joe Kraft. He's the president and CEO of Alliance Resource Partners LP. You can find him and uh, more about Alliance on the web at ARLP.com. Uh, so, Joe, I know you, uh, we haven't seen each other in person a long time, but I always ask my guests, what, what are you reading? What, what are books are on your bookshelf or, or on your desk or on your nightstand? What, what are you reading these days? Well, I, one of the benefits that, uh, that I that Ke Kelly and I received from her uh, service uh, as the ambassador to Canada was we got to meet Jordan Peterson. Oh, yeah. And uh, so Jordan has become a friend of ours. Uh, and so I think he's actually coming to your city in January. Uh, but uh, so he and I uh, have spent time thinking about education and how we can continue to recruit uh, people that believe in capitalism and believe in freedom. And, and so most of my reading is on trying to think on how, you know, A, what, a, you know, what he writes. I mean, I read everything he reads. His books are right on my bookshelf right. uh, because I think his view on life and, and what it means for young adults as to taking responsibility and trying to be a productive member of society. He speaks to, I mean, I've watched him speak to a lot of uh, folks. We were just with him over Thanksgiving and uh, got to see him speak to, again, some folks in Cambridge uh, that was amazing. And so uh, I tend to, to read his works and, and works that he would recommend to me uh, to keep me focused on what my goals are in the philanthropic area. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a big fan of his as well. Um, his, uh, if you haven't seen it, I've recommended it many times. His, his understanding of the Bible and his lectures on the Bible are quite remarkable, especially the one on the Sermon on the Mount. I just think it's, it's one of the best I've heard. So, yeah. um, what it gives you hope, this is the last question for you. Cause I know you need, need to run here, but, uh, you've you've had a remarkable career and you're now in a business that suddenly has become if not fashionable suddenly people are realizing hey maybe we're going to need coal after all what gives you hope well uh 
you know, one of the benefits that, uh, well, one of the philanthropies that we've invested in is a craft academy. So we're, we are providing an education for, it started at 60 uh, juniors in high school, and now it's going to grow to around 90. Uh, so it's a, there'll be 90 juniors, 90 seniors, and then now we're following them into their in in uh, high school and where when, where, junior, where is that's this? That's in Moorhead, Kentucky. Okay. So it's on campus at Moorhead State University. So they are uh, getting an education in STEM education, uh, the best and brightest of Kentucky can apply for these coveted slots. And then by the time they graduate from high school, if they would go to a state school in the, in Kentucky, they would have almost two years of college credit to where they can then graduate earlier or take a semester off and do study abroad or do things that uh, allow them to really make a difference in the world. And so we call it STEM X. So the STEM is to get a great education in science and math and the X is to be entrepreneurial but also uh, be giving. You know, there's a service component and the, you know, my hope, because I've seen now over 200 people that we've helped through college and through this program, these people are amazing. And to see the innovation and the ideas and the desire to, to accept the responsibility uh, to make America the best it can make. And these aren't political statements. These are just individuals that have God-given talent that want to to say, God's given me this talent. Now, what's my purpose in life and how can I make the world a better place? Having this experience to, to get letters every semester about these young people's lives and, and what they're doing, it just gives me a lot of hope that, uh, that notwithstanding the misinformation that goes on out in the media and social media is bad, and in my view, you know, we got to get back to the fundamentals of trusting each other because we got great people in America and we got to get back to where we can talk to each other and have sharing of ideas and avoid these separations. You know, we were so hopeful as a country that Biden would be a uniter. Unfortunately, he's decided, even though he campaigned on that, he decided not to do so. So it's my expectation, whoever the next candidate for president will be that they truly will be a uniter for this country because uh, we have the saying in Kentucky, united we stand, divided we fall. That's the motto and I, I believe that uh, uh, very sincerely. So we need someone uh, to bring all of the talent of America together and get back to where it was where we all want the same thing for America. We want America to continue to be strong to be the world leader in freedom, and we want freedom for our people. And, uh, and that's, that, that just takes leadership. And so my hope is we got that. And we now have to get that message out. We got to right, elect the right leaders uh, so that we can, uh, uh, again, unite, no matter what your political spectrum is, that we can unite people on the great things that we're trying to do so that America can be the world leader uh, like it has been. And what I think most of those that are freedom seekers around the world want America to be. Well, I'm going to put you on the stump here, Kraft, because you <laughs> may <laughs> run, run you for office here pretty soon. Yeah, there you go. I don't, I don't have any desire for that because I'm 72 years old. Not that you can't be 72 and still run, I guess, but uh, <laughs> as Biden and Trump. But, uh, yeah, I think I'm better served doing what I'm doing. Sure. Well, uh, Joe, thanks for your time. It's been fun to talk to you. Uh, my guest again is uh, Joe Kraft. He's the president and CEO of Alliance Resource Partners. You can find him and his, more about his company on ARLP.com and find out uh, what's, ha what's happening in the coal market. Uh, so, Joe, thanks to you for being on the Power Hungry Podcast. All you out in podcast land, until next time, see ya. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Joe.